Hi, this is Scott from Hereticals Rafa. This is the final, the fifth out of five uh, video lectures that work us through this 106 page uh, slideshow presentation um, on the uh, first, um, the first lecture on the rehabilitation of, uh, of uh, classical political economy. Okay. Um, again, uh, the point here is to be sure to um, indicate that uh, economic theory is much broader than any particular perspective. And what we're trying to do here is we're trying to introduce the classical understanding of the situation, which in my opinion is a lot more cogent and a lot more relevant to how do we understand the, the manner in which capitalism actually functions, right? And so that's the whole point. We're not just doing this in order to do some type of history of thought exercise, but rather we're doing this in order to uh, appreciate how the classicals understand how capitalism actually functions. And that that is a legitimate way in which our science needs to progress and that this idea that economics is only about decision making choices under uncertainty and constraint optimization and some type of behavioral science nah, that, that ain't on like economics only one particular approach to what economics is and I challenge uh, I challenge the discipline to you know to stop lying please about this economics is much more broader than any particular perspective this one included it's broader than my perspective too or this perspective that I have. I mean, I'm not saying that mine's the only way, but I'm also saying theirs ain't either, right? And I think it's really important, especially for the younger generation, not to let my generation and older lie to you anymore. I think that you need to reclaim economic science back from the ideological, you know, constraints that have been put on it, quite frankly. And I think that's something that uh, that 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 we have to do. I, I think that uh, that that's that's clear. So we. Begin Begin here with the um, with, with, so what we did so far we did, we did a one we did the unassisted labor wild strawberry model we added unassisted gold to get the and assume the mint price of gold to get the monetary sector we then looked at the assisted corn production model when the unassisted wild strawberries model we had a profit factor which is the rate of exploitation in the assisted corn input model we have corn as seed as an input we now have the profit rate as the distributed variable. So they're going to, of course, be related, and you're still going to have a rate of exploitation in the corn model. It's just that you're going to have a profit rate, which is going to determine the, um, the distribution to the owners of the capital stock, right? We begin here with the money value input output table. And so here we have the notion that the value added by living labor is going to be equal to the value of the net product. Here, this is the paragraph 10 equal paragraph 12 in Srafa. This becomes the fundamental cement of the subsequent distribution relations. Here we have the double entry bookkeeping understanding that the newly created uh, value in the system all right, what, what Adam Smith would call the wealth of the nation, okay, the newly created value of the system is going to have a double entry bookkeeping relation where you're going to have the value of living labor and the value of the net output, both of which are going to be equal to each other. And that notion, that magnitude of value conceived in, these, uh, in this double entry bookkeeping way is going to be which, that which is distributive. And that, con that, that uh, begins... Our um, that begins our uh, our framework. Okay, so we saw this already in one of the earlier slides, uh, looking at the unassisted labor model. Well, the distribution of the value add is going to be exactly the same. Well, the division of the pie is going to be exactly the same. What we're going to have now is the distribution to the 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 uh, means of production, right? With the with the with the with the uh, corn model here, right? So here you have your double entry bookkeeping, the value added by living labor, the value at the complete wage rate is equal to Y, the va and here we have the output account, the value of the net output is equal to Y, that's going to be that total pi, and then we're going to change our distribution from pure wage revenue to pure profit revenue, or let me say pure wage remuneration to pure profit remuneration, pure wage remuneration, the wage share is one, the profit share is zero, pure profit remuneration, the wage share is zero, the profit rate is one, okay? And we also have the, um, uh, uh, we also have the, um, the, the profit rates, okay? I should actually do that, all right? So we could actually take this up 
and this is going to be uh, the profit share here, and then you're going to have, this is going to be the profit rate is going to be equal to zero. All right, let me take that up a little bit here. All right, that's going to be the profit rate is going to be equal to zero. In the general case, the profit rate is going to be a number between zero and one. Let me put this here, zero here. We we'll want to make this the superscript. Okay, this is going to be the profit rates here is going to be uh, uh, zero is going to be greater than um, uh, is going to be less than R star right? is going to have your star there, which is going to be less than your maximum rate of profit R. All right. And then that's going to be your R star. And then this is going to be your profits. And in here you have R. Um, I'll put uh, 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 uppercase R. I had a row over in the other um, slideshow, but you have it there is that. All right. It's equal to, I'll just hit row. I guess I could find my row. All right, it's not that hard to get it. It's going to be here, and I go to my symbol, and I think I have my row here. All right, but I don't like that particular row. It's that one, but in any event, all right, we'll have this one. That's why I don't use that one. All right, maybe make this one. All right, so that becomes your row. Okay, and so now you have your, um, your, uh, your, your, your distribution. Okay, so again, pure wages, wage shares equal to one, profit shares equal to zero, rate of profits equal to zero, Pure profits, weight shares equal to zero, profit shares equal to one, rate of profits at its maximum value, which is equal to capital R, which is equal to rho, which is equal to the output capital ratio. Remember from the previous slide in your one commodity corn model, the output capital ratio is given, right? That's a given magnitude in the structure production. Sratha in the multi-commodity case will, will, uh, will find that to be the standard ratio. All right, which is going to be equal to the max rate, but it's a physical magnitude that comes out of the physical structure of production. In the general case, the weight share is between zero and one. The profit share is between, uh, uh, let me say, in the general case, the weight share is between one and zero. The profit share is between zero and one. And the rate of profit is between its maximum bound of value zero, I mean, its minimum value zero to its maximum value of, uh, of R, which again is, is equal to rho. Okay? Why not? So we then have this idea, all right, of the distribution of the, of the value added. So the question becomes, where does the profit come from? How does this distribution relation hold? And the answer from the Marxian perspective certainly is the idea of the, um, of the, uh, uh, of the, um, the, the theory of exploitation, okay? Here we establish the fundamental and dangerous notion that the productive living labor of society creates the value added and hence the value of the net product. It's dangerous because here we see that the value is the created is a process of creation from the labor side of the coin. Capital doesn't create value here, which then portends some interesting questions of if it doesn't create value, well, how does it get a share? And so those are the issues we got to look at. The question becomes then what determines the distribution of the newly created output? And this is where ideological theories come into, into the matter and into the story, in my opinion, because then we start to see, okay, what are the reasons why profit earners earn so much profit and wage earners so, earn so less wages? I'm going to keep it less wages because certainly we know that wages are... Uh, wages are, um, are, 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 are not robust these days, to say the least, right? Marxist critique of political economy advanced the line that, as with Ricardo, labor deterrence value, that if, as with Ricardo, labor deterrence value, then unpaid labor must determine profit. The secret of surplus value, the secret of profit making. Here we have Marxist theory of exploitation, to which I argue that Sarafa agreed, or I, I agreed, you know, may or may not be, may, may be a little bit extreme to say that. Certainly, we, uh, we know that over a 14-year period, um, Sarafa utilized uh, a conceptual category called the pool of profits, where the pool of profits, in my read of it, comes in this article I have in 2014, um, uh, the pool of profits there represents extracted unpaid labor. And so here you can begin to see my reading of Srafa uh, uh, looks at it in that relation. And, and 
really, it, I mean, I should probably re rephrase this. You know, it really, it doesn't matter what Sraffa really agreed to or not. I, I, again, it, it doesn't matter why. I mean, when, when, when Professor Solo uh, comments on my paper, he says, well, well you know what, Sraffa might have used this concept for 14 years, but he abandoned it. And, and that's right. He might, you know, Sraffa did abandon it. But the question then becomes, well, we can still use it. All right. It's a conceptual category that I think is relevant in developing the, the exploitation uh, theory of profits and developing more generally the, um, the, the Marxian theory of wage labor, which, which, um, which I think is really important, which I think is really important to do. So my read of this comes from, and my, my idea that Srafa actually is meaning this unstracted and unpaid labor stuff comes from Srafa, the history of what Srafa was going through. In 1940, Srafa was interned on the Isle of Man for a three-month period. And while there, he read, or more correctly, reread Volume 1 of Capital. Now, he had read Volume 1 of Capital in French in the 1920s. Here he had the Aveline and Moore translation, the Ingalls edition, in English that he read on the Isle of Man. And that volume appears in Srafa's library. And if you're ever at the Wren Library, check it out. Uh, fetch that particular volume. And inside, you'll see that Srafa has a series of notes. Not only are there a lot of marginal notes on the spine and the back of the book, I mean, on the back, it's not the spine, but on the back of the book, the back and front covers of the book, but there's also a, an envelope that contains, I think it's 13 different pages that Srafa writes in inserts in there that were written either while Srafa was on the Isle of Man or shortly after he got back to Cambridge in 1940 after Keynes was able, was able to rescue him. And so what I'm showing here is this, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the um, on, on the development of Srafa's project in this PowerPoint. We got a whole series of PowerPoints that I'm going to look at. We're going to really go through and develop uh, Srafa's, uh, Srafa's story uh, 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 very thoroughly. It's, it's all out there for us to do it. But this, this timeline, we're here. Okay, So Srafa in 1940, he's interned on in the Isle of Man and he reads Capital. Okay, then in 1942, and from 1942 to 1945, this constitutes the period of constructive activity that Srafa did in the 1940s. It was the second of three periods of constructive activity. And when I say constructive activity, I mean activity that's related to the production, to, to the, to the, um, right into production of commodities, right? And so he began in the 20s, uh, and then the 40s, and then the 50s, and this is the period of the 40s. And so this, it, up until 1945, from 1945 until 1955, Strava had to finish Ricardo, right? I mean, he, this had been going on since 1930, actually. Keynes had actually put him in, uh, in charge of that, and Keynes wouldn't live to see because Keynes died in 1946. And so Strafa had to get busy on the Ricardo edition. I will say, I'm going to come back to it, though, in 1943, which is when Strafa wrote uh, his black notebook, the, the uh, which appears as D191. Um, it's, it, Gerke and, and Kurtz have an uh, article called Srafa and Borkevitz, and they, and they go through the, uh, the, uh, uh, the notes in D191. It was written in 1943. Also in 1943, um, and also here you have the marginal notes, uh, D1, D31233 and D31229. It's Srafa's writing these notes in 1943. Also in 1943 was the finding in Ireland of the lost mill papers in the Ricardo course. There is where we have uh, sort of a found absolute and exchangeable value and, 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 and the treasure trove of different um, heretofore or at that time unknown um, works of Ricardo. So that delayed even further the um, the publication of uh, of the Ricardo correspondence, but it was there. I mean, you imagine what Strava was going through at the time. His mind is very fertile. He's working on these very interesting theoretical questions and economic theory. Nobody, just, he's doing it himself in these notes. And then come the Ricardo papers, the Lost Mill papers, rather from the uh, the attic in Ireland. Oh my God, he, I'm, I'm sure that it was just an amazing uh, amazing time for, amazing time for him. So he finishes his Ricardo and. The, uh, and then in from 1946 to 1954, and then in 1955 he re, he, he commences again the third and final um, final period of the um, 
of, of constructive activity. And, and then in 1960, he publishes his book. And what I'm doing here is that these are two particular sets of notes that Sraffa is going to refer back to in the Majorca draft of March of 1955, which is archived as D31252. I recommend that people read the Majorca draft. I, I'll do a, uh, a, a, a video on the Majorca draft probably before I do uh, uh, some of the others. It's a wonderful thing. And plus, I have the whole thing transcribed and people can start to, um, can start to read it. Okay, um, so the idea here is that what I'm saying, all right, so the way, the reason why this is relevant for our framework is that in 1940, Srafa reads Marx's uh, Volume 1 of Capital. Now, this is going to be related to this question of the, the, um, the, the, the extraction theory of profits, right? So we have here, okay, inside the edition of, uh, of, of Capital, we find this note. This is written in uh, November of uh, 1940, okay, and it says here, but it's inserted in his volume of Capital, okay. The greater the degree of exploitation in the society as a whole, the greater is the distortion, i.e. divergence between values and prices. So again, we're looking at the price value deviation question as... The greater the amount of snow fallen, the greater is the distortion of the surface of a piece of broken ground, i.e. the divergence between the surface of the snow and that of the ground underneath, since the snow collects in the cavities. And so, the way I read this is the following way, okay? I call this trough of snow, all right? For me, snow for Srafa represents the extracted unpaid labor. This is going to be the snow that is falling. Because what Srafa says is that there's going to be more divergence as we have more exploitation. If there's more divergence with more exploitation, that means there's more unpaid labor to be distributed to the different owners of capital according to the value of their capital advanced. That's the cavities in the ground. And so why I'm drawing it here, you can see that the cavities in the ground that's going to represent the anarchic structure of production in an economic system and in an actual economic system and so you can see that a certain quantity of snow falls on the broken ground and fills up the cavities at different lengths and different depths of cavities but at the surface it all looks smooth all right, so now you can begin to see how Srafa is framing the distribution question. And so then we say, all right, well, when the rate of exploitation is less, boom, you ain't got as much snow to shovel. When the rate of exploitation increases, you got a lot more snow to shovel. All right, and so you can see here, there you have the relation of the divergence between the uh, surface and the, and, and, the, and, the, and the broken ground, okay? So this, uh, uh, this relationship here, this is a little slide on, 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 on Marx, how Marx, I would agree to something like that. Now, this kind of visually shows how I see Srafa's project to manifest, okay? What you have here are the two, are the economic systems. One is going to be the actual economic system where the broken ground is going to be all anarchic and, 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 and craggy. Then you're going to have the standard economic system where in the standard economic system, what Srafa does is he takes the actual economic system and according to the the watershed proportion labor to means of production ratio, which not coincidentally is equal to the maximum rate of profit is equal to the standard ratio. That's all this here. Okay, the notation is a little bit different on this slide because I cut and pasted this from an earlier paper. But the point I'm making here is simply that we can restructure the actual system and then we can express surplus and deficit industries and then we can take the same amount of extracted snow, extracted under paid labor and we can repack that in terms of a more uh, uh, a, a more cogent way to understand the distribution relation that is less anarchic this is what Srafa tries I argue what Srafa accomplishes with the invariable measure of value here you just have two industries one surplus and one deficit industry but in in this lower graph in, in panel C says that, well if you have a variety of different industries you're going to be able to vis-a-vis -vis the water Watership proportion, you know, a, a demarcate the different industries in your end commodity case from the surplus industry whose labor to means of production ratio is greater, and from the 
deficit industry whose labor to means of production ratio is less than the average, where the labor to means of production ratio is going to be the inverse of the capital labor ratio. The L I call it the LMP ratio. The LMP ratio is the capital labor ratio as it appears in Srafa, which is the inverse of the traditional capital labor ratio. But in any event, there you have your, your, your actual and your standard relation and kind of gives an idea of, of my read of what Srafa is trying to do. I got a whole PowerPoint on that. I, I, I'll talk back. I'll talk back to that. I, I get this out of Eatwell's, um, uh, uh, some of Eatwell's work in the 1970s, but I know there's a lot of controversy on this and, and the whole question, and, and, and I don't want to get into, the, uh, in, into endorsing any one particular approach or not, okay? But I do think that, uh, that I would encourage readers of uh, many things, but definitely read um, from the Quarterly Journal of Economics, uh, Eatwell's Mr. Stravis, Stravis can stand a combined rate of exploitation, just to give a, a kind of a, a framework of where I'm coming from at least uh, and, and see and again I'm not necessarily saying it's the only way or whatever but in any event so now we're going to be looking at class struggle right we'll come back to this all right so now you got exploitation oh well, if the source of profit is exploitation well that means that there's if, if you want to increase your profit well you want to increase your exploitation right and, and here we're assuming that there's no technical change okay so that the only way to increase profit is increase in exploitation all right which is here Right, going to be that distribution, and we're gonna, boom, you're going to be squeezing the labor as the circle gets more blue. Right, red's going to be pure labor, blue's going to be pure cap. I mean, pure profits, and so the movement to the creation of profit is going to necessarily result in the, uh, at least in the, um, in in the non-technical change system, a, a, a decrease in wages. Right, this is going to be the class struggle. I put it here. Blue's a profit. Uh, uh, reds the wages. I, I try to show on the bottom. I, I get these images on the, on, on, on you know their open source stuff. Just Google search the images. What I like about the lower image is you got farmers and workers together. All right, which I think is 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 is, is rising piss. And then you got the uh, then you got the capitals up to squeeze. And all right, I, I'm on the worker side here, guys. I ain't lying. Marx understood that. Marx was a class conscious revolutionary man, and I am a worker. I will tell you that right now. I got a whole video. I'm going to talk about that. I am a working class intellectual. I know I have punched a clock for my sustenance, okay? And that's something that means something. And, 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 and that's my trip. And, and I'm not, you know, impugning any type of whatever on anyone else, okay? Everybody has to deal with their own thing. But for, my, for me, uh, working class consciousness is very important because having a working class understanding of the way capitalism functions is very important because the capital, the bourgeois understanding, even if it's the progressive bourgeoisie, doesn't necessarily have the working class uh, uh, at, 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 at its heart here. And, and, and we see that with the Brexit and Trump phenomenon. I don't want to get political, so I'll, I'll be quiet. But this is the relation we're looking at. All right, so then we look here. All right, so then I give you the distribution of the net product. And basically, I'm going to go through with the different relations, means of production, all in our money structure, right? Uh, a means of production, a, a value added, wage share, profit share, exploitation rate, wages, value added, profits, value, I, I mean, wages uh, is equal to the wage share times value added. Profits is equal to the profit share times the value added, and then your rate of profit there. And then you can see how that works. All right, so you have all the values there. Here we have increasing profit, decrease your profit. This is going to be the class struggle, right? What determines this? Well, in the 1950s, so goes the myth, the wages were, well, the wages were higher, but the 1950s, you had more wage regime, and then in the 1980s, you had more of a profit regime, and so then you have this constant struggle here between wages and profit, and what determines what the actual distribution of the net output is, that's the $100,000 question. For my money, it's going to be on how we organize. And it has to be a matter of class struggle. Hence, ergo, the notion that working people have to organize in a way in which we have never done before. Okay, that requires a lot of, uh, a lot of class consciousness on the part of workers and, and people who want to identify with workers and understand the nature of it, in my, in my estimation. Right? So that's going to be the distribution there. Okay, then we draw it in terms of both of our schedules. Quadrant one has our wage, uh, our wage distri our distribution schedule, and quadrant two has our extraction schedule. And so in quadrant one, we have pure wage, and this is going to be pure wage distribution. So now we're just going to go down, right? And so now we're going to, we're going to increase the profit rate, we're going to decrease the wage share, and we're going to see how this works there. All right, so 
I have all the same values that I have in the other, uh, in the other slides now expressed in terms of that. It, again, this is your class struggle. Okay, and then you can also express it this way here. All right, and so here I have on the, the top, of course, there's going to be the extraction and the distribution, and then this is going to be the price. Okay, this price is going to be the price when the price of corn is going to be equal to $1 per unit. Okay, and so this then becomes the distribution. Of course, you can see that the prices don't deviate here. This again is going to be, it's going to be our gold as numerator of type B, right? That, that's what we're going to have there where the price of corn, the money price of corn is going to be constant. We can, of course, do labor commanded, but you're going to have those infinite prices, which are going to look like the infinite extraction rate we have there. So I'm not going to put that. We're going to have that. But there you can see that in the one commodity model, in that particular specification, of it the price of corn is constant it doesn't change and the wages do and the wage profit schedule do and so we see that happening there in the two commodity case we're going to see how the deviations happen which is why i put it that way okay so this is the end of the preliminary exposition of the uh, of the one commodity model what we've done here are income account okay so well, what we did was the following we looked at the unassisted labor model with wild strawberries we added to it an unassisted gold model for the wild strawberries model we had a profit factor attached to it one plus the extraction rate we then looked at the relations of value and distribution for the one the um, one commodity unassisted wild strawberry model we then introduced the corn model. With the corn model, we have the assisted production of corn, where corn's going to be assisted with, um, by, by the seed. We're going to have an input there. Then we're going to have the, uh, the, the physical relations and the value relations. Here, we're going to have the profit factor attached to it. And the profit factor here is 1 plus the rate of profit. You have the, distri the distribution relations where you're going to have the uh, weights here is going to be unity. The rate of profit is zero. The extraction rate is zero. The weight share goes from unity to zero. The profit rate moves from zero to its maximum value, capital R equal to rho, equal to the output capital ratio, and the rate of exploitation goes to, inf uh, goes to infinity. The output capital ratio is going to be given by the structure of production. We look at the relationship between wages and profits, and we ascertain our distribution schedule. The next uh, slideshow that I'm going to put up is going to be uh, uh, lecture two. And in lecture two, we're going to look, uh, continue with the one commodity model and look at the um, relationship between the income and the output accounts and develop the um, a more formal uh, relationship there. Okay. All right, so that's it for the first PowerPoint. Download the lesson, uh, the, the uh, PowerPoint, use it, uh, add to it, write to me what, what you see, um, uh, you know, anything you get, get to me too. I'll put it up. I mean, this needs to be a collaborative effort, guys. We have to read this stuff together, and I think it's important um, in order to hold economic science accountable because they're forgetting it, and they'll let it happen. All right. It's up to us to say, no, 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 not so fast. OK. And it, it damn near slipped away here. But thank God we can try to pull it back. Um, and, and that's what we're trying to do. OK. All right. Take it easy. See you online. Peace.